Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center. And this week we're having the American Conservation Film Festival out here in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And because of that, we're very fortunate to have uh, a brand new film on the passenger pigeon called From Billions to None, and a very distinguished panel on passenger pigeons here, uh, who I'm gonna introduce shortly. And then we'll show a trailer from the film. So I'd like to welcome first David Blockstein. David is senior scientist with the National Council for Science and the Environment. Uh, he's done a great number of things, but his his pigeon related activities including conducting uh, research on the conservation of tropical pigeons and doves uh, and communication excuse me community ecology of forest birds also and he's the author of the birds of North America account of the extinct passenger pigeon which uh, makes him a well-regarded member of this panel then we have the uh, director co-producer and co-writer of From Brilliance to None David Mrazek He's a documentary filmmaker and a web-based media producer. He's produced a number of PBS documentaries on topics ranging from the Hamilton Burr duel, Woodrow Wilson, and the unseen microbial world. Most recently, he's co-directed The Principal Story, which aired on PBS in fall of 2009, and actually after that, From Billions to None, which we're going to show out here this nice evening. Nice Did I miss any of the no, films? No, that was <laughs> Thanks, David. And then sitting directly to my right is Joel Greenberg. He's a consultant and writer specializing in natural history. He's authored numerous books, including A Natural History of the Chicago Region and the just released A Feathered River Across the Sky, The Passenger Pigeon's Flight to Extinction. Uh, really one of the, the first books in a long time on the passenger pigeon's extinction. Um, so a much needed addition to our uh, libraries here. So we have the most distinguished passenger pigeon panel we could possibly put together. We have a scientist, we have a filmmaker, we have an author, uh, and a historian here, although I offered nothing except questions. And because it's a film festival, because we all got you here for the American Conservation Film Festival, I thought we'd start out uh, with the trailer from this extraordinary new film. So let's see uh, a minute and a half of From Billions to None. Let's imagine a flock that's a mile wide and 200 miles long. And the front birds are coming down to glean from the field. Yeah. And imagine being ahead of this crashing wave of biology working its way up the center of the continent. And the eruption of wings, it was so loud that these men with guns were terrified. There were tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of passenger pigeons. And we lost it from billions to none in a matter of a few decades. It was us. We're the ones who made that happen. Incomprehensible. That's something we think can't happen. We are killing about 100 million sharks per year. That means about 11,000 every hour. It's absolutely unsustainable. It can happen to the bluefin tuna. It can happen to the polar bear. It can happen to the wolf. The extinction of passenger pigeon species was pretty well marked. It was September 1st, 1914. This abundant bird um, ceased to exist. Well, it's my job to bring the passenger pigeon back to life. If extinction isn't forever, a lot changes. I live every day thinking about how could this go wrong. In today's world, we could never recreate the natural phenomenon that was the passenger pigeon. Let's remember what we once had and use that as a way to think about today and to think about tomorrow. So that was the trailer from, from Billions to None, uh, the new film about the passenger pigeon's extinction. It's a very good film. We're going to show it tonight and Sunday. We liked it so much, we're showing it twice. <laughs> and the first question I have is an obvious one for, for David Mrazek is what uh, made you choose this project? Well, it was my uh, friendship with Joel, actually. Um, I had been interested, actually sought him out, um, read A Natural History of the Chicago Region, and was just completely enamored with the idea that we still had remnant prairies in the Chicago area, and that, you know, 10,000-year-old ecosystems. And he started giving me a tour of, of these prairies, and those, those clips actually end up in the film. Um, I was thinking of a 
different project altogether. Mm -hmm. And then he got a, he was writing this book and said, do you think this would be an interesting topic for a film? And he said a few sentences and it clearly was this amazing forgotten story, really. I mean, Joel argues with me and says, it's, um, I know, <laughs> <laughs> birders, birders know about yes, it. Yes, yes. Birders know about it, but <laughs> the general public, they do not know about it. I, I, and I that, concur with yeah. that. There's no real <laughs> disagreement. Yeah, that. so um, it was just this fascinating story that, that um, needed to be brought to not just the book, but to, to be part of this, uh, this larger outreach of Project Passenger Pigeon, Pigeon and bringing awareness to the centennial of this incredible extinction, you know. What are some of the challenges, David, of making a film about something that's extinct? Well, that's the first <laughs> challenge. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first challenge is, what are we going to see? And so early on, I realized we re really wanted to try to have some computer animation that would bring the birds to life. Um, and so um, that was that was a key thing. And I'm working with a Media Arts Academy in Chicago. Um, helped they they brought that about um, because this was a this was not a big budget project so um, w I worked with um, essentially students um, who have the the latest software that you know Finding Nemo was created with so um, it was a long process but it really paid off I mean it's something that people comment about again and again it's a real feeling that you're experiencing what it was like what it might have been like the, the descriptions the written descriptions of the birds in flight um, made it clear that this was really um, a very rich opportunity um, for cinematic treatment. I mean, yeah. to try to show um, these um, birds moving, and so you know, that just sort of yelled, "We we need to do to do a film." We can talk about this a little later too. But uh, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of seeing the film, like like we all have, um, there is some amazing CGI in it, even sound of of what. A million of these passenger pigeons might have sounded like, looked like, pretty extraordinary stuff, the likes of which I haven't seen before. But let me jump to David Blockstein just for a quick question. You uh, come in with significant ornithological knowledge. Um, why is the, the passenger pigeon an interesting bird species? There was nothing like it. There was absolutely nothing even close to the passenger pigeon among the 700 plus species of North America. Nothing like it in terms of their numbers, nothing like it in terms of their, um, their movement, and nothing like it in terms of the story of a population that was enormous and then nosedived very, very quickly. Joel, you've written a whole book on the passenger pigeon, but let me do a cruel thing here and see if you can give us a nutshell history <laughs> of the bird. Because as, as David mentioned, I think a lot of people actually have forgotten the passenger pigeon, sadly, and, and don't know its story. So if you could give us a, a nutshell history, and then we'll, we'll dive into to some specifics in a minute. Okay, so the passenger pigeon ranged from the Atlantic to the Great Plains, from the southern shores of James Bay to the Gulf States. Mm -hmm. The large nestings for which they're best known, generally, and there were exceptions, occurred in a swath from New England across um, the, the Great Lakes and then down through Ohio and in, into Kentucky. Um, they looked like morning doves. Um, in the book I say they look like morning doves on steroids. They're a little bigger, they're a little more brightly colored. Recent genetic work shows that they are in fact not all that closely related to morning doves but to another group of pigeons, which has um, the best known American species, is the band-tailed of the West. Now, and this is similar to what David was saying, I mean, in my view, the bird was unlike any other bird human beings have known. Um, the, the population, um, probably in the billions, but you know, certainly the certainly largest in this, this mm -hmm. continent. Um, the, um, they aggregated um, often, not always, and that's forgotten too, they nested in little groups and they moved around in little groups, but they also would aggregate in huge numbers that are difficult to imagine today. So the most famous is John Audubon talking about a three-day trip along the Ohio River um, in Kentucky where he said the sun was eclipsed for three days by, by sheer volumes of birds in the sky. And the third is, and, and as a segue to point three, is, um, there was a, 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 an observation 
at Fort Mississauga, Ontario, um, maybe 100 miles or so from Toronto. Major Ross King of the British Army saw a flight that lasted 14 hours of one day and a portion of two others. He didn't assign a number to it, but he described it in great detail. I think the fact that he was a major in one of the principal armies gives it additional credibility yeah. in terms of his capacity to estimate distances and making some assumptions and depending how fast you think they were flying, between two and 3.7 billion birds. And it was, we don't know the exact date, it was around 1860, and so we'll say that. The last wild bird shot was in 1902, and the last of the species um, died on September 1st, 1914. So the the um, depletion of such abundance, certainly among vertebrates, I mean, um, is also arguably um, unique. So, um, and to make the story even richer, you know, it's, it's, it's about 300 years or so, the story, there's some remarkable people mm -hmm. in it too. I mean, if you want to engage people, uh, we being a narcissistic species <laughs> yeah. like to read about ourselves. And sure. there are, you know, um, Simon Poe Kagan and Junius Brutus Booth. There's some really interesting folks. Um, and, you know, the bird was never studied in life. So it's, uh, people have conjectured um, what impacts it had on its ecosystem. It clearly had to have. And its absence in such a short period also had impacts. And, you know, as they say in the book, it's like looking at a play and then seeing the play again with a character or two missing and trying to fill in what, you know, why things were as, as they were. And so um, some of that is certainly new. Um, the, um, in, in the research, I found two late records. Um, uh, the, the bird shot in 1901, for which there is still an extant specimen. The 1902 bird shot in Laurel, Indiana. Um, the, the specimen's gone, but the documentation, I think, is really, really strong. And then also um, that makes the story so uh, powerful is it's a rare case, certainly, again, among vertebrates, uh, certainly among birds, when you know with great, with, with virtual precision, um, when the last bird died. If Martha had died seven years earlier, you couldn't say as certainly that this is the last one, but it had been a decade or so since the last credible record. So, you know, here we had a bird with a name. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that all adds to um, why this story um, is so powerful. And, and the final thing I want to say about it is there's so many aspects of that story that are so relevant for today. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, um, just because something's abundant and it could be water. You know, um, if we're not careful, there's seven, there's more of us now than there were passenger pigeons. There's seven billion of us. Um, we can lose it, you know, and something rare can go like this. So, you know, there's other aspects too. So I, I think that you know, the biology of the bird and these other ancillary issues um, make this a pretty um, compelling story. Great, great. Now we'll open it up to the round table. We literally have one here. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, I'll uh, throw out some questions and, and anybody can answer or you can answer mm -hmm. in, in conjunction or sing your answers, whatever you choose here. <laughs> and, and the first so obvious funny. one that everybody's wondering is uh, why did the passenger pigeon go extinct? And it's not an easy answer, I know, but We'll trust well, I think we, our pigeon posse <laughs> to come up with a, a yeah. scenario here. The, the, the key, I mean, it became a commodity, um, became the cheapest terrestrial protein. With the um, introduction of railroads and telegraphs in the 1840s, um, that I think, I think we agree on that, tipped the yep. bird into its spiral to extinction. So the railroad meant that wherever the birds were caught, no matter how remote, if you could get them to a rail station, you could send them to the burgeoning urban markets of the Midwest and right. East. And in fact, the 1881 nesting was in Oklahoma, um, and it took three days by, by wagon to get them to the nearest station. Um, se secondly, um, the telegraph meant that wherever the bird showed up, that information could be disseminated quickly and widely, and telegraph operators were specifically instructed to do so. So you almost had a monitoring of the population. So that enabled there to be developed national markets, and to, su to supply that, there was a group, anywhere from 600 to 3,000, of professional hunters who did nothing but chase these birds wherever they showed up. And then that effort was augmented by local talent. You know, I mean, oh, here's extra money for me, you know, more food. And 
and and so you had people, you know, when they were nesting, um, people going into the, the, the colonies, they were burning, they were shooting. Some birds abandoned the uh, exercise of nesting altogether. Others abandoned eggs, others abandoned squabs. The squabs, being the baby birds, were highly coveted, um, and people went after those, and then, you know, the adults were being killed throughout the year, so, you know, as David says in the movie, with little recruitment and this incredible mortality, um, population <coughs> collapsed. Right. Uh, my postdoc advisor, uh, Stan Temple, has a graduate student, uh, Jessica Stanton, who's done some population modeling, and she's shown that it takes about uh, a third um, mortality and uh, um, failure of, of the reproductive effort to basically take a population from um, several billion to none in a, in a space of 60 years. And so, as, as Joel said, it was the relentless slaughter. People say, well, overhunting killed it. Well, it's not hunting. It, it was, it well, was see, a- I think it was hunting of a different kind. Well, it's it, it was, it was it, yeah, but it's not what we, what we have currently as, as, as hunting. And uh, it, it was a commercial business, essentially. It was basically, it was the killing the goose that laid the golden egg, and it was not just killing the birds, but it was, as, as Joel was saying, was this relentless persecution in the nesting colony. So it doesn't take a population biologist to figure out what happens when you shut off the main source of reproduction of a species for more than the, the lifetime, the average lifetime of the bird, that the population is going to plummet. Now, now, there's a lot. The bird was never studied in life, and, and that's an interesting. So one thing that has always intrigued me is um, the birds did not, I mean, there were these large colonies, but in Manitoba, for example, they were common, but they didn't nest in colonies. So a question that I have, I mean, nobody ever bothered to see whether these smaller groups ever successfully brought off young. I mean, we know that buttons, the bird was shot in 1900, the last young bird. I mean, that was raised when there were virtually no other birds around. Um, that's, you know, that's a question. I've, you know, obviously, there wasn't enough to keep them, keep them going. But um, And um, these, dis one of the things, if we'd had a bigger budget, I would have loved to have recreated some, the, the, some of these hunting scenes. They were just yeah. these apocalyptic, that, yeah. these descriptions are just apocalyptic with burning and sulfur, you know, burning the sulfur under the trees to knock the birds out onto the ground. Um, Audubon um, described seeing a person with a rifle shooting but the sound of the birds was so loud, he couldn't hear the report of the gun. I mean, that is loud. I mean, that's just mind-boggling. That, that, am I correct? Yeah, no. Uh, yeah. And, and, and like, I want no, to make no, sure. No, no, no. And, uh, and, and they describe the sound like, you know, a train in a tunnel. Right. And, and you, you know, hurricanes, yeah. the loudest things right. yeah, that and, you and, can and conceive in 19th and century. And that was a really interesting, fun thing when I was working with my sound. I've, I've got a great sound designer in Chicago, and he layered... You know, we, I gave him the descriptions of a variety of, you know, one description is, uh, uh, it, it sounded like hundreds of uh, draft horses tramping in the distance closer and closer when they were a distance away. And then the sound of multiple threshing machines yeah. and locomotives going through a covered bridge simultaneously um, and a tornado and all these things. So he layered the sounds to try to come close to something like that. He layered um, Tornado, a tornado or two, an earthquake, um, a herd of buffalo, um, uh, an industrial dryer. He layered them all in, or kind of organically in waves, as in that some of the scene you saw in the trailer, which is a depiction of Audubon. We hear an actor reading um, Audubon's lines that he wrote from experiencing that. So, yeah, it's just this, as a filmmaker, it's just those are just such incredibly cinematic, mind-boggling scenes that took place, and they were part of our daily life, you know? And we just can't comprehend nowadays something like that. And it did affect American culture, so these things that we're talking about, if you saw that, you're not gonna forget it, right. you know? Um, and if you're an artist, um, you're very well may incorporate it into your work. So America's first symphony composer, his master work, was a nine movement piece on the passenger pigeon. The first important novelist, um, his first work, James Fenimore Cooper's The Pioneers, includes a section on passenger yes. pigeons. So, you know, it, it 
Play, there's hundreds of place names across the range. Um, there are plants, fruits named after um, uh, pigeon berry, pigeon, pigeon berry. plum. Right. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there's a variety. So, um, you know, it, it, it did did have an impact because you didn't have to go to remote places to, to see them. And people have no idea, like now, you know, Dollywood is near Pigeon Forge, and you know, that, right. that strip there is so touristy, or the Titanic Museum, Pigeon Forge, people don't, and the Pigeon River is right there, people don't, all those tourists Never have no it. idea Never think why it's... It. But when you go to the Pigeon, I was there, when you go to the Pigeon Forge Information Center, on it's the a, top, they yeah. have passenger pigeon uh -huh. images. Right. So at least yeah, somebody at least they got made that, that yeah. connection, or at least they did this year. Yeah. 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 Right. But, 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 but I think what you guys are saying is that in many ways, the story of the passenger pigeon is the story of America. The story of a super abundant... Um, species in a continent that was filled with wildlife, filled with, with habitat. We, as people, the Westerners came in, colonized it, they over-exploited, they introduced technology that contributed to the destruction, and it then also had an impact, the loss of the passenger pigeon did have an impact in the 20th century in terms of helping develop the first American conservation movement, which you know so mm -hmm. much about, Mark. Yeah. John French, in his Passenger Pigeon in Pennsylvania, the second book ever written about it, said the bird was a martyr to our progress. Um, some other yeah. 19th century writer said it should be the national bird because it's like Americans, they go in little groups and you know they don't care. If, but These are great uh, lines, why didn't you say them in the phone? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I would love that. There, there's, there's uh, always, passenger uh, Pigeon, uh, Billington uh, Nun Part uh, 2. Yeah, yeah, that, there we <laughs> Return. There, 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 that, we'll right. talk about that in a bit. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> right, that's right. A I thought we only had 57 minutes. <laughs> minutes, you know. Right, right. So, I mean, yeah. Um. Well, let's build off of what David Blockstein just said. How does the passenger pigeon help create the American conservation movement? Who writes about it, and when do they start to actually notice its decline? Um, well, the decline in, in um, a guy named Ravoyal, um, a French visitor in 1840, was the first who really said, if they keep killing the birds like this, they'll become extinct. Audubon, about the same time, said, oh, they'll never kill them into extinction. The forests have to disappear. Audubon also thought they nested multiple times. They only laid one egg a year, which is an important Right, and that's a very key that, Yeah, that was and, not good for them. And, and in the literature, um, you know, whether it's 50-50, it's 60-40, I mean, people, there's a lot of disagreement, but all the birds that um, laid eggs in captivity all had one egg, so that's pretty definitive. Um, so, um, so, so Ravoyal, um, as time went on, um, by certainly the, the 70s and 80s, um, the hunters knew that they were um, dis disappearing. And, and the way, I, I mean, they, they could have done two things. They could have said, I love sh killing pigeons and traveling killing pigeons. Let's lay off and see if the population rises. They didn't do that. They said, this is a revenue stream, and if I don't kill these birds, you're gonna take my money. So the hunting became more intense, and that's an important point too. I mean, they didn't just, um, and so in 1882, which was the last time there were any nestings of any numbers, three in Wisconsin and one in Pennsylvania of about a million birds each, the squabs, I mean, when a bird is first hatched, it's feathers and bones, not much to eat. So what they would usually do is wait a few um, weeks to let it get some meat on it. In 1882, About 10 days. 10 days. <laughs> That's all. Now they days. okay because they they're, they're, uh, they're, gone, they're, they're gone. They're gone within 12 to 14 days. Okay, yeah. so they would wait. But in 1882, as soon as the birds hatched, they grabbed them, the squabs. They put them in barrels. They stopped them in a paste. You know, people it was cr cr crummy product, mm -hmm. but um, so. You know, I mean, it wasn't until um, they were gone, by and large, and um, uh, the first federal law introduced, um, it was introduced on the House in April of 1900 by John Lacey, congressman from Iowa, who cited, he said, it's too late for the wild pigeon, but there's still much good work to be done. So, you know, it's not the only reason, buys in the fight over the use of heron feathers for hats, but it was clearly in their mind. I mean, they knew this, and that helped inspire those, you know, that law, and then closely following it was the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, so it, it right. clearly and, and, had and, an and the Lacey Act really was directly related yeah. to this 
issue, which was, and it, it's the same issue that we're, we're still <laughs> dealing with in conservation today, which is voluntary versus regulatory. That the passenger pigeon was an unregulated commercial market. The Lacey Act, passed in 1900 by the United States Congress, regulated the trade of wildlife for the first time. Throughout the century, the 20th century, and even into the 21st century, the Lacey Act has been amended to yep. include more and more kinds of wildlife, and by God, we finally even have plants protected yep. under, under the Lacey Act. But it is still the same argument that we're talking about now with climate change. Should we regulate? Mm -hmm. Should we have voluntary? The, the other, another aspect, um, there, there was um, a book that, that you all, um, The Tragedy of the, the Commons. Yeah, that that's what I was thinking of right. when you described yeah. the pressure. So the fact of the matter is, um, you know, the federal sovereign, I mean, which is the only thing that could reach across the nation, was not active until those first laws in the right. beginning of the 20th century. The same reason that in the movie we talk about pelagic fishing as an analog to um, what happened to 19th century um, wildlife. I mean, there is no country can can regulate fishing in the open seas. It, it takes cooperation. And so, um, if you're going to have conservation, I think, I mean, you need strong government. I mean, if you're going to have places to look at wildlife and places for wildlife to live, you need, you know, a, a strong state and federal presence in, in order to, to, to do that. Yeah. yeah, and just to build off David's, it, it makes a lot of sense. When we go back and look at the 1900 Lacey Act, it has a focus on interstate trade and commerce. So it's exactly what you said. It's the market hunting of passenger pigeons. It's the feather trade. All of this, uh, the wildlife was obviously being collected and then shipped to Chicago, New York, these other urban centers where it wasn't available. And in fact, the first Lacey inspectors you have to put a plug in for our archive. <laughs> They're oh, yeah. almost all in rail stations. So we have all these lazy, ah. we even have badges of them uh, being at rail stations trying to see what people were moving, which makes wow, sense with what you just told yeah. us, Joel, about this mm -hmm. is how market hunted birds and so on were being transported. Uh, I'm curious, I mean, how much enforcement must have been in those early years must have been a real challenge. I mean. Making well, the passenger pigeon was easy because there weren't any well, right, in the wild. Right, right. But other <laughs> the feather other, trade and so on. It yeah. was, yeah. was fairly. I mean, wardens rigorous. were killed. Yeah, wardens were killed. Uh, the, the, Guy Bradley. Guy Bradley is, is a famous yeah. one. With passenger pigeons, um, starting in in the 1850s, some states started passing laws right. to protect songbirds, and so Ohio in 1857 did so. They weren't sure what to do with passenger pigeons, so they created a special subcommittee of the Ohio Senate. That committee deliberated and um, rendered its verdict, which was the pigeon is so abundant, its numbers can never be reduced, which the Ohio Historical Society recently proclaimed as one of the 10 most embarrassing moments in Ohio history, <laughs> along with the burning of the Cuyahoga River. Yeah. <laughs> Only one state or province ever banned the killing of passenger pigeons, and that was Michigan. That's the good news. Bad news, it was in 1897 when there were none left. Yeah. And some states never did change their laws. I mean, in Ontario, they said you can't kill songbirds, but you can kill passenger pigeons. And that's, I think, still in the books, or it was, you know, at least decades after the bird was, was gone. Let's talk a little about the passenger pigeons in zoos. What's that story? Um, that's an interesting. So in 1900, there were three flocks. There was one in Milwaukee. Um, there was um, one in Chicago and one in Cincinnati. Um, there's some interesting aspects of that. So um, Whittaker in Milwaukee was, a, was an amateur. He obtained two pairs of birds from, from an Indian in northern Wisconsin. One of those pairs, one bird died, the other flew away. So they all came from one. And he bred them. It was on banks of the Wisconsin River in Milwaukee. And he claims, and this is something I discovered really after the book, that um, in, in 1896, he was on a trip and came back and all of his pigeons were stolen. And they were um, then sold to Whitman. Whitman was a professor at the University of Chicago who was mostly interested in animal behavior. He was one of the very first to study animal behavior, and he had 35 kinds of pigeons. Not interested so much in them as birds, as much as trying to test a particular theory. And so, According to Whitaker, Whitman bought these for $1,500. He, he didn't know they were stolen. 
and eventually Whitman gave some of those birds back. And so whether Martha, Martha was born in one of those flocks. If she was born before 1896, she was born in Milwaukee. If she was born after 1896, she was probably born in Chicago. And there was breeding in Cincinnati Zoo, was the second oldest zoo in America. Um, there was breeding, but there never was the concept as we have today um, of breeding them to protect them. Um, now Whitaker in, a, in an article in 1924, long after, said, oh, I was trying to breed them uh, to save them. And Whitaker in that article says he raised 75 passenger pigeons. So that is seems, that right? wow. that's, but no one knows what ever happened to them. Um, so they all died out. Um, and then there were the two left and, and Martha. One interesting thing is that from 19, those flocks, every one of those birds that died, including George, the second to the last passenger pigeon, were all thrown away. There's no record of them in collections. No, George. George is uh, is in the Smithsonian. No, he's not. That's not George. They they put us in. Not George. They just named it. They just named it. They did. They named it. But it's not second. But if you notice, George is not on the display. They just took this other bird before him. Now there's a bird I saw yesterday in Cincinnati that was from the zoo, but that was the 1880s. But but after in 1900, you know, they weren't even worth it. Uh, if you want to throw out something, I don't know if we talked about it. This, um, So when Martha, well, when Martha died, she was put in a big block of ice and sent to the Smithsonian, where she's been ever since. So Dr. Shuffelt, when the bird arrived, did a necropsy. And one of the things he found was she was missing part of her lower gut and I think her liver. He said as if they were removed with a blunt instrument. Well, there's an article that someone wrote saying she was killed by her keeper because the keeper saw she was in pain. The keeper wanted to be the last um, keeper of, of the pigeon. Um, now, you, you would have easily discard that, except that the reality is there were organs missing. And um, I think that's just one more you know, mystery uh, about, about Martha. Um, she so was an intriguing. By Jack the Ripper, yeah, who, who, who yeah, was uh, that, that, there? There you go. So, um, you know, that's just adds to to the mystery. I mean, this is this iconic bird, but um, you know, there still are important aspects about her we don't know. And the Cincinnati Zoo had a fire um, where all their records were destroyed. So those kinds of materials, uh, uh, if they were recorded, didn't exist. And I love the the very after the fact descriptions. Um, many conflicting of Martha's last hours at the Cincinnati Zoo. You know, these very melodramatic depictions of people weeping. She's lying there gasping her last breath. It is, it's How did she end up going from Cincinnati to the Smithsonian? Well, as he said, it was a 300-pound uh, block of ice right. encased on a, in a railroad car. And, yeah, and, and ironically, shipped by train. Yeah, yeah. shipped well, by train. Yeah. Well, well, well yeah. here's even There's better. better yeah. So um, Whitman, besides teaching at the University right, of Chicago, right. was the first director of the Woods Hole um, Lab in Massachusetts. So when school let out, lab, yeah. he would load his pigeons up. So the only migration Martha ever did in life was by train. And the only flight she ever did was flying first class from D.C. to San Diego once. And one other time she flew to um, Cincinnati. So she spent her life in a cage, never yeah. knowing you know, what birds know. And ironically road trains you know and and later of two jets and i would just tell our viewers if they are ever in cincinnati to go to downtown cincinnati uh ninth street and vine which is in the film john ruthven a uh, well-known painter had a painting of his a mural made and it's just a i mean it's a, a fanciful painting because martha is free and you see the aviaries uh from the zoo and she's flying up with a flock behind her but it's a beautiful painting and um really uh um I, I, I'm really proud of the fact that in the film it really strikes an emotional, I mean people, a lot of people seeing the film really comment that that's a particularly emotional moment. Um, we see it painted and then it's revealed. Well, especially with this 80, what, 87 year old? Uh, yeah, 89, 89, 89 year old, yeah, 89 year old. Standing on scaffolding, on scaffolding six stories in a, high. In a yeah. Cincinnati summer. Yeah, you know, and, yeah we didn't um, say how and, hot and, it was. And all, and all these uh, students working with yes. these yes. people. And, you know, and I mean, because he's, he's uh, you know, he's of a generation that his parents right. would have seen or would have been able to see the passenger pigeons. Right, And right. he's painting this mural then with people who are now in their 20s who, uh, you know, would be about the age that uh, um, 
that his parents might have been when he mm -hmm. was, you know, when, when Martha died. So. Mm -hmm. Something that David, this is a little off, but um, I, one of the places I've been this year was the Detroit Lakes Bird Festival, which is in Minnesota, about um, an hour east of Fargo. And then afterwards, somebody, an elderly gentleman came up. He was 90 years old. When he um, was, um, what, 16 or so, he met a guy who was 80 who killed birds when he was young. And it haunted him throughout his life that he collaborated in the destruction of this bird. So to be one uh, degree of separation mm -hmm. from somebody, mm -hmm. you know, who actually knew people, um, you know, that really kind of moved, yeah. moved me. Yeah, so you think about it, you know, 100 years, uh, the centenary of the passenger pigeon, and that's, it's a long time. I mean, anybody who lives a hundred years is quite rare in, in our society, but, and, and that, as you were saying at the beginning, that as a, as a culture, we've lost this knowledge in a lot of ways, but it really isn't that long a time, as, as Joel was saying, in terms of generations. And so, you know, with, with David's help and Joel's leadership and Project Passenger Pigeon, that's really what we're about, is trying to bring this story back to the American consciousness. If I had the resources, I would have loved to have done a poll to see, you know, have you ever heard of a passenger pigeon? Yeah. And then if they said yes, you'd say, you know, is it a bird that carried messages during World right. War I II? Is it a car that the French, you know, <laughs> give them four choices and the real one. Yeah. Um, and it would have been interesting. And then I thought it would be cool then to have compared it. But um, hopefully um, with our efforts, everybody's, um, more people know about it now than they, they did, I mean. Um, no doubt. We thought about uh, doing an unscientific uh, poll to open the film, just walking on the streets of yeah. Chicago and interviewing a wide variety of people, asking them if they knew what a passenger pigeon was. And I, I mean, just based on my own experience with friends telling them about what I'm working on, even people that I'm good friends with, I, this took a couple of years to make. Two years into it, how's that carrier pigeon? Yeah, right. I, I mean, it's like, oh, hey. well, the National <laughs> Science Foundation, when they yeah. rejected yeah. our grant, uh, one of the writers referred to it as carrier, carrier pigeon. pigeon. Yeah. Yeah. That, it's just that's so easy for people that, to slip into it. But, well, and, 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 you know, sometimes I've encountered people I, I did not expect who did know. Um, I was at a major museum talking to three people, and um, the youngest person in the group said, oh, you know, Charles Darwin worked with passenger pigeons. Eek! <laughs> this is a, a major natural history museum. So, uh, you know. He did work with pigeons. He did work with pigeons. Yeah, yeah I, know, wrong I, I don't think ectopistes, but um, anyway. So it, that's, It's uh, interesting, because he did work with a lot of pigeons, and yet you, you, you're telling me scientists in this country were relatively uninterested in the life history of passenger pigeons. Well, I mean, there wasn't, you might know be better. careful not to say carrier now that you right. uh, Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, there really wasn't a lot of field ornithology. I mean, there certainly wasn't censusing, and I mean, there weren't a lot of the techniques um, that that we have have today. I mean, Simon Pokagan, um, the last great Potawatomi chief, I mean, some of his descriptions are about, you know, come as close to, to a close scrutiny of the bird and his prose is just you know mind-boggling you know it's stunningly beautiful um but you know again i mean you know, audubon with audubon's painting the um most iconic um it comes up for criticism craig who was an assistant of whitman's craig published an article in the awk in the early like 20th century, and he lists, I mean, he's got a page and a half of mistakes in Audubon's painting, you know, the <laughs> male would, or the female would be right, feeding, right. I mean, and their yeah. positioning, and so it's a beautiful painting, but, you know, there was inaccuracies, and even now, the internet, there's this made-up story about the last big flight, or big flock in Ohio in 1896, there were 250,000 birds, all but 5,000 were killed, and all the dead birds were put in bar barrels on a train which crashed, and they were all wasted. Oh I mean, God. I train, and, and Stephen Jay Gould used it in his, I mean, people, <laughs> you know, if you didn't know, it might sound plausible, but as far as I can tell, it's just made up out of whole cloth, so people are still making but, things yeah, up but about part it. part of this, I think, is that the idea, I mean, is, you know, the title of the film, From Billions to None right. is just so mind-boggling. I mean, billions, a concept yeah, of right. billions of birds and the idea of, you know, flying this flock that is going from mm -hmm. morning to night. As and, far as and, you can see from left to yeah. right, just going over you, yeah. Yeah, and, and so that's mind-boggling in itself. 
and then you say, and then they're all gone right. within a space of, so, in the know, wild, in a space of decades. 40, 50 yeah. years. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's really hard for people to, to, to think about that. And, and so they come up with all sorts of fanciful mm -hmm. explanations because the, the well, reality is so hard to understand. Let's segue from the nun to one of the more interesting parts of the film that aren't directly related to the history, and that's the, the de-extinction uh, movement for the passenger pigeon. Tell us what that is and, and uh, what you all think of it. <laughs> well, who, who should start? <laughs> Whoever well, wants to. So th the very first meeting um, occurred in January of 2012, and David and I went to it. Um, it was at the Harvard Medical School and brought in um, uh, an ethicist from the Stanford Law School and science editor from National Geographic. There were genetics people and there were some bird people. And one thing that was interesting to me is at the end of it, um, the genetics people, I think this is fair, um, were a lot more enthusiastic. And the people yeah. who knew birds were a and, lot and, more. And new conservation. And were a lot more skeptical. Yeah. Now, as time has gone on, that, you know, they've talked to, to many more, more people. So one of my, um, you know, now, they, even among themselves, they sort of acknowledge that you know they're not going to create a pure passenger pigeon. It's going to be this band-tailed pigeon with passenger pigeon attributes, and um, you know that might be a good thing because you're reintroducing maybe recreate processes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one one idea that I mean, you know, apart from the technical aspect, whether you could do it or not. Um, and I think you told me this, that more mourning doves are shot than any other game bird in the right. United yeah. States. So, you know, if you create this flock of passenger pigeons, you put your love into it and all this money, a lot of money. and you yeah. get, and they leave, and they wind up in a place where people are shooting passenger, or uh, mourning, mourning doves, doves, the passenger pigeon can be the first species in history to become extinct <laughs> twice. <laughs> so, you know, well, that, that would be a new project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. but, 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 but it's not going to get there. I mean, no. you know, I think, yeah. and this, this well, is, this when is, you say not get there, how do you mean? Like I mean, in, the, I mean, the, you know, this is where you really have to separate science and science fiction. That the project that is proposed is to identify the critical genetic elements that made a passenger pigeon a passenger pigeon, and then splice those genes into the genome of a band-tailed pigeon and create a quote-unquote passenger pigeon. As, and as Joel says, it's, it's not going to be passenger pigeon. We right. all a, know that a, 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 any species is more than just the genes. It's, a, it's the evolutionary history. It's the behavior. It's the epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And so what is the, the result of, and, and I think, you know, the genetics people are very, as Joel said, they're very confident that they can create something that would have characteristics of a passenger pigeon. But then you get to the question, I mean, you know, so that's one thing is, what is it? It's not a passenger pigeon. And then you go to the, the ecological question, which is, okay, what? why did they go extinct? They went extinct because they needed to have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of birds in a population Well, that's even unclear, survive. though. I don't know if that's true. If you, right. if you took away the mortality... You know, the fact that there were birds breeding, I mean, buttons is an example. If you mm -hmm. took away the mortality and you protected them, you know, treated them, I, I mean, it's Perhaps. conjecture, but right. I guess I would be inclined to think they could survive in smaller numbers. I mean, I, well, that's but the an whole, open the question. Well, the whole evolutionary but, strategy and, and ecology of this bird was to be one of hundreds of millions And there of were birds. these populations, there, you know, out you know, there. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but you're talking... A tiny, tiny fraction. So it would be like that an, really right. had no ecological impact on the species would, as a whole. It would be an art, artificially created little flock. And um, as as Ben Novak, who's the researcher who's trying to do this, um, he's saying it, it would be hundreds of years before a flock of any size would be produced. And the larger question is where, why exactly are we doing it, and where would we? If they're just going to be in a zoo, if they're just going to be a novelty, well, they're not why? talking about that. No, but whether, I know, but, but if they're going to be what, what at is, a, you know, in what, some kind of we, refuge, what kind of nature do we have these days? Right, right. And, and what's the future of nature? So, uh, uh, an analog that that Beth Shapiro would say that you can't bring these back, but it's still worth trying. She gives an example. There's been research 
in, in Siberia that if you have large quadrupeds running around um, putting down the vegetation, you're insulating and preserving the permafrost. So her argument would be if you could create an Asian elephant by mixing it with, ma with mammoth DNA, and it looked like an Asian elephant, but it could, th the difference is it survives the Siberian winter, that's a good thing. You can introduce those and you're helping the larger ecosystem. So what she's suggesting is you, you're not recreating, you know, the species, want, you're recreating, um, you know, processes, you know, like when we introduce fire to, to an right. ecosystem. But what would the passenger the pigeon is, is not, and we don't know be, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's more of an open question in yeah. my mind, you know, so. We're running out of time. This is a great example perhaps the most perfect one, of how something that's been extinct 100 years can still instill great passion in Absolutely, people as we yeah. debate Absolutely. it. Yeah. And, uh, it's a rich topic and uh, one I wish we had more time to delve into, but uh, we actually do have to let you all get to the festival tonight oh. and show the <laughs> right. film. So I'd like to remind folks, uh, it's an extraordinary film. It's called From Billions to None. I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, and Joel Greenberg's book is called Under a Feathered Sky. Uh, uh, a Feathered River Across I'm sorry. the Sky. A Feathered River Across the Sky. <laughs> show, just show it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there you go. go. And I'll, and, and so the, we get it right. It was right, and as long as we're providing information sources, that all of this information and more can be found at PassengerPigeon.org, which is a website for Project Passenger Pigeon, this uh, all-volunteer effort that uh, we and, and many others are a part of. It's and a the, great website. And more information about the film at BillionsToNone.com. Um, and also look for it, um, looking like January, it'll be broadcast on uh, PBS World Channel, which is oh, a excellent. variety of markets across the country. It's not every, every city, but a lot of them. So keep your eye out for, on your schedule in January. Thank you, David, David, and Joel. Thank all of you for tuning in. And once again, the, the film title is From Billions to None, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So we can talk now? <laughs> we're off, we're off, I was like, you know. Now you can.